I want to talk tonight about the old distilleries uh, and the new. So we all know that there was there's, there's, Ireland has a huge history of, of whiskey, but I've touched on it before about not many people know just how close it came to disappearing, but some of the whiskies that have been have managed to survive the duration and other ones that are I call them the Lazarus brands you know they've been raised from the dead you know H have they really risen from the dead or is it uh, well just a, a case of slapping a label on it and that's it uh, so, so, um, how, can I, how can I answer this delicately Justin um, some of them is very much a slap a label on uh, and other ones it's the uh, a bit, a bit more thought and a bit more care and a bit more attention and, and homage to the, the heritage of the place. But some of them very much it's a slap on label job, you know. Okay, well, uh, we'll find out more. So what's first tonight then? Well, what I want to do is I want to show you this, this wonderful book. Uh, if you are a whiskey nerd, uh, this is basically your Bible for information about whiskey in the late 19th century. Okay, this is Alfred Bernard's book on the distilleries of the United Kingdom. So this was Great Britain and Ireland at the time, obviously. And on the back, you see the man himself. Um, what he did was he went around the various distilleries uh, in the UK and wrote down what they did, you know, what they were uh, producing, where they were located, how he got to them. So it was kind of a diary based on, on on the distilleries. So they were published sort of weekly, and then this was all amalgamated into this wonderful book. Now, if we go to the Ireland pages. So when he came over to Ireland, he lists all of the, the distilleries that he visited. And he talks about them in, in really great detail. And, and it's a... It's very well written. There's lots of little uh, drawn uh, drawings, sort of etchings of the distilleries. And um, it goes through a nice history of the places. Um, and it's, 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 it's a real reference point. Now, the reason I want to start with this is some of the names of this, of these distilleries, disappeared. And now they have made a comeback. So when he's going through this, he, he lists, for example, uh, the Royal Irish Distillery, Bow Street, Phoenix Park Distillery, Tullamore. Some of these names, obviously, are, are familiar today to, to whiskey aficionados. But lots of them have disappeared, but you will find out about them again. They are coming back. So he lists... Is that, is that book still in print, Marty? Is it? Can, can, can... No. Very much. Very much so. It's now it's 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 forty pounds to buy, um, but well worth it. But you, you you could spend hours, and especially if you're going to to Scotland or going to a distillery, that is one of the the new ones that's that are is, is reappearing because you can get a bit of a comparison and a bit of a an idea of what they were like and what they are like now. So a fantastic read. So he goes to the twenty eight distilleries in Ireland, except for one. So typical East Belfast, he goes to the, all of the rest of them get, you know, pages, except for the even Ilda Stillery in Belfast. Okay. Right, okay, yeah. Where, he goes, this distillery is about half a mile from the previous chapter. The proprietor stands conspicuous as being unwilling to allow an inspection of his works, for what reason we are unable to explain. <laughs> <laughs> so, typical East Belfast, Thran, I think is the word we use. Secretive, secretive. Yeah, but his son then goes on to explain. Uh, we learn from his son that it was built in 1882 and had an annual output of 850,000 gallons. You know, it was a big operation. So it was. So... I thought that I, I quite like the fact that he went to every other distillery in the UK, brings him in and shows him everything and talks about the history of the place. <laughs> and he spelled fast to say no. <laughs> 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 ah, you got to you got you got to love it. You got to love it. Uh, a bit like Thackeray, you know, he went everywhere except Carrick Fergus and his tour of Ireland, which is a bit. How do you miss Carrick Fergus Castle? Uh, at least we know. At least, at least we know the uh, Alfred uh, didn't go straight it. 
No, he very much wrote it himself. And as I say, all the distilleries, the way he writes the stuff uh, is really, really engaging, really nice. He, he's obviously an accomplished writer. Uh, so so it's well worth, if you're a bit of a whiskey nerd, really buy that book. Um, uh, it's well worth doing. But I, I want to go back a little bit to then jump forward to his time and then come up to the modern time. So uh, okay. I know it just joined it. When he came here, as I say, he had 28 distilleries to visit. But there was lots of different... L- l- well, it was normally to do with tax, which meant some of the distilleries appeared and disappeared and so on and so forth. So prior to 1600, there would have been countless little distilleries up and down the country. You know, there would have been, up and down the island of Ireland, there would have been thousands of them. Pretty much the the, 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 the farmer, the man would have been out and farmed the field and the wife would have essentially stayed at home, looked after the home and done the brewing and also did distilling. They did this at home as well. So it would have been very, very common for pretty much every house. But it may have been that some pubs and inns and stuff, they had their own distilleries again. And really it was um, just a common household practice. Jumping forward a little bit, um, in and around, well, I suppose the start of the 17th century, we know Bushmills has on its label these days, 1608. But what happened was, in 1608, what happened was uh, the local bigwig, so Sir Arthur Chichester in Belfast, was granted the right to grant patents to to people who owned townlands, essentially. So he granted a patent to a man called Thomas Phillips, who... Uh, this was the first whiskey patent in the world, and that was granted uh, in April 1608. So this was a way of having taxation, having generating tax, because once you get a license, you have to pay for it. Uh, so basically, they were granted monopolies. When this was granted, there was also a man called Sexton down in Leinster. He was granted a patent. There was a few other people as well were granted patents in and around this time. Now, the old Bushmills Distillery as a company wasn't registered, and I keep having to look down because I've got some dates down because my dates always get a bit mangled. Uh, You're just looking down at me because I'm up here looking up at you like that there, you see. (laughs) No. (laughs) In sixteen and uh, sorry, seventeen seventeen eighty four was when Bushmills old Bushmills was registered as a company. So it is extremely old, but it's not actually as old a company as if I can just see it here as as Kilbegan. The Kilbegan company was registered in uh, seventeen fifty seven. Okay, now. If you ever get a chance to go to Locke's Distillery down in Kilbegan, it, it's a wonderful, it's like a, it's a picture postcard distillery. It's absolutely beautiful. It's all been restored and back in business again. So this is, we'll talk about, about this later on. So you have also got um, a man called Peter Rowe buys a, a brewery, but I think he bought a brewery originally and then converted it to a distillery. So now you have the Rowe name, um, and he's a distiller in Dublin. So these guys are now companies. These are businesses that have been set up as businesses, um, not your sort of your pub that happens to do a little bit of distilling on the side and a bit of brewing on the side. These are dedicated companies, but they would have been, certainly in terms of today, tiny they'd have been tiny little things um probably a couple of hundred gallon stills you know so they wouldn't have been very very big what they would have been producing we wouldn't recognize as whiskey today was size an indication that they were going to survive or did some of the ones with low volumes survive and one of the some of the ones with big volumes disappear well what happened was in 1779 there was a law brought in that taxed the capacity of the still. Not actually what you produced, but the capacity of the still. Okay. So if you could make bigger volumes, you you had to pay more tax. Even though you weren't producing it, 
you had to pay more tax. So what happened was lots of, they had to basically process a lot of volume, which meant an inferior quality uh, and, and there wasn't as much time and care taken about it. It also favoured the bigger distilleries, okay? Because if you could make more, you can pay more tax and so on and so forth. That's, I mean, that's just the way of the world. Now, when that law was brought in, there was 1,228 distilleries registered in Ireland. So 1,228 distilleries in 1779. Literally, um, a year later, it was down to 246. The small ones just, there's no way they could produce enough. So you still had 246. These would have been a bigger capacity, but again, in terms of what we have today, I mean, they would still have been been tiny. Uh, but eighteen twenty two, Ireland was down to forty, forty legitimate stills, uh, distilleries. Uh, but a man who he's instrumental in the whole whiskey story is a man called Aeneas Coffey, who created the the column still talked about those one time before the, the rather tall continuous process still yeah. well he estimated there was about 800 illegal ones so you can kind of gauge that people were still drinking huge volumes but there was only 40 actual properly registered um distilleries okay okay so with that in mind um Again, there was another law change. These laws kept changing, and depending on the laws that were, were enacted, the number of distilleries either rapidly increased or, or decreased. Uh, by 1835, there was 93 distilleries in, back in action. So again, you kind of get this, depending on the law, boom, up, probably some of these distilleries were operational illegally. And they have never the law changed. They were some... so was there was there amalgamation and splitting and selling and re-establishing brands even back then? There there would have been, uh, but brands at the time is they wouldn't have necessarily been what we would classify as a brand today. Um, you have the sort of start of it in and around the start of the nineteenth century. Um, certainly, names like Jameson and stuff were trying to to establish their reputation because there was counterfeiting going on. People were passing stuff off. They would have been made illegally and uh, passed off as, as Jameson or Bush Mills. So they wow. were trying to establish the brands. That's what goes on. I mean, we're, we, we know that this kind of thing happens quite regularly. Uh, 1823, the largest pot still in Ireland was 750 gallons, right? Uh, by 1825, Middleton had one that was 31,500 gallons. So a total change. You know, this, that, that, that's a comparable size to what we have today. You know, that's the, the, the increase is just enormous. Okay? Now, by this stage, you started to have some of the names that we recognise today. Obviously, Bush Mills, uh, Kilbegan, but you also had the likes of Powers and Jameson. Uh, coming in that coming into play at that time, so these were established names that we're 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 familiar with today. Okay, okay. Now, throughout the nineteenth century, there was lots of of different changes. There was different uh, changes in taste and and what people liked. Um, Irish whiskey reigned supreme. Um, it, it was it was really really what people preferred they liked that nice lighter flavor uh, triple distilled uh, you, you you know it was very approachable very nice it wasn't as heavy and as oily and as medicinal as as a lot of the the, the Scottish whiskies so it really was the, the big thing um you also had um the start of uh blenders and bonding houses. People who would have bought in whiskey, blended it, stored it, and aged it themselves, and then sent it out as a as a as a, a, 
a product of their own. They don't have their own distillery, but they have uh, their own brand. And for that, I'm kind of thinking of the likes of JJ Corey. Mm-hmm. Um, again, Kirker and Greer. I talked about them last week. Um, you know, you had the you had these brands that were they were making up their own their own style of whiskey. So yeah, Kirk and Greer. You see the advert. Uh, I mean, these these were big outfits, you know. So again, they had these brands. Now, so what what happened? But, uh, if they didn't have their own distillery, uh, how did the brands feel about them existing then? They, were they supplying them with the, the raw material, or Absolutely. was it? Yeah, they, they they were buying in whiskey from um, all over. Now, Kirk and Greer, I just seen the advert you have up there. Kirk and Greer did end up running a distillery. Uh, I mean, they, they set up their own distilleries, but. What I mean is, they they would have bought stock from other distilleries. Uh, everybody does this even today. I mean, most most companies won't use just one single product in their entire range. I mean, that wouldn't really be beneficial. So, I mean, today, for example, we have the the supermarket own brand stuff that is bought that uh, they buy from different distilleries licensed label it as, as something else and, and sell it. I mean, this has been going on for a long, long time. So it's a perfectly legitimate way of of doing of doing business. Now, through the 19th century, you had lots of really good um, time, a good time really for Irish whiskey. Once you start getting towards the 1900s, this is when it all starts going wrong. And it starts going wrong on an, it, basically a perfect storm. Um, everything that possibly could go wrong essentially went wrong. You had everyone, lots of people think it was prohibition in the States that, that really put the nail in the coffin. Okay, it, yeah. It wasn't, okay? One of the big things was um, the invention of the, 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 the column still, the, the one that Aeneas Coffee. Produce. So can I put this on screen? This is this is one of these wee small time outfits that they would have had. That's the yeah. sort of small time outfits, and yeah. uh, they went from that, and then they went to big ones like like this here. That's what they ended up with mass massive ones like that there. That's abandoned, I think, and, and that's that's basically what happened. They went from small to big, uh, small. and and that's where it sort of went pear shape for them. Well, it went, everything was going great until you had the, the column still came in and lots of the Irish producers kind of thought it's it's not really whiskey because it wasn't particularly flavoursome. Um, in case you're wondering what I'm doing, I am dispensing into a glass. Last week I got told off <laughs> even my from about you drinking out of a tin. So, okay. I, 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 that, that was a talk, that was a topic of conversation all week, Marty. By the way, I know. Right, like, Belfast Deal. Um, I, I quite like this. This is really nice. Um, the White War Brewing Company. Belfast Black Stout is really good and bought. Really good. Anyway. Home bar, home bargains have some got, got some great offers on in the beer. By the way, in Larne, seventy nine p a bottle. I must, I must get a run down. <laughs> anyway. Where was it? Oh, yes. So, into the 20th century. Beginning of the 20th well, century. Before we get to the 20th century, can we, can we run through some of the things tonight? Because it's it's really massively busy tonight. I know you can't necessarily always see these. Uh, no. If you want to get in touch with the show, always go to our Facebook page, Irish Whiskey Review slash live, and, and you can comment and share from there. And then we can see them, right? So I'm going to run through some of these tonight. I'm going to say hi to some people. Uh, remember, if your name comes up on the screen give us a wave we can see you we can see you in your nighty brona there you go how are you brona there you go brona's there hello hello <laughs> philip as well good evening to you and uh trevor watch is watching again tonight in 
Fermanagh. Yeah, there you go. I'm I'm heading down to Canoe the River Blackwater uh, later on this month, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Mark Kerr has been saying, uh, looking forward to another evening of educational crack. I tell you what, normally I do this about 10 minutes in, but I was that engrossed in what you were saying tonight, Marty, myself, that it was 20 minutes before I realised the time. Um, Mark, Mark Kerr saying... Uh, like green spot etc like green spot so we'll, we'll come back to that forum later on uh what, yep. what was what was he referring to there with the the the, the... he's referring to the uh the, the, the this idea of buying in your your product your your yes. thing so stuff was brought in by a blending house um uh, the, the metals um it was labeled as as a the, the the terms green spot, yellow spot, and red spot are, are well. There's three brands, and that refers to the marks that they used to put on the barrels. Uh, the guy who decided what was going into what put the marks on it. Uh, now seen as a, a well, a, a quality product. Then um, a bottle of red spot, which would be the higher end one, it's about 120 pounds a bottle, there or thereabouts, maybe a wee bit less. Um, you know, so. That easy marks a hundred percent right. That that's what I mean when I say about these um, blenders and, and uh, bonders and stuff. You know. So. Uh, and uh, Bert Bert was saying uh, some knowledge there, Marty. Yes, thanks for that, guys. And uh, we've got a couple of mentions. Uh, Sean O'Neill saying hi as well. And uh, to get us back on track and into the twentieth century, uh, Nick Ryan says, "Silent spirit." That yeah. is. Spurt from column stills was yeah. known as that back then. Why? Because uh, the, the old stills bubbled and churned, whereas this just went. No, no it was really because it was called called the sort of silent spurt because it was seen as being really an inferior product, and it, in some ways it is. It doesn't get the it doesn't take on the same flavor, um, and it, it it was put in. It was blended. I, I talked about blended whiskey, yeah. You know, like Bush Mills is a blend where they use some malt, uh, some malt and, and really stuff from pot stills, and then water it down, if you like, with, with silent spirit. So it's not really influencing the flavour. Um it, it it was seen as a very inferior product. So what happened was lots of the Scottish brands started to use it. Because they had the big, heavy, pita, phenolic uh, spirit that if you watered it down with the silent spirit, with, with green whiskey, um, it could still be flavoursome. It actually was probably more palatable to the average punter than, 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 than the single malt, as we would know it now. Irish whiskey, they didn't tend to adopt it. They thought it wasn't actually whiskey. They, they argued that it wasn't whiskey, and actually there was a Royal Commission set up in 1908 to actually determine whether it was whiskey or not. When the Royal Commission came back, they said it was. And this was a bit of a hammer blow to the Irish whiskey market. Okay. I bet you there was probably a lot of uh, old retired judges and brigadiers wanting to volunteer to be on that, one, that committee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can I get on that pango? Yes, please. <laughs> no, so uh, this was a bit of a blow. There was some Irish whiskey distilleries who had adopted the column still quite quickly. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Dunville's you know, on the Grosvenor Road. That was their stock and trade. They, they used to export huge amounts of whiskey to Scotland. Uh, but that was in 1908. Now, you have to remember at this point, there was... Uh, a lot of whiskey was sold straight from the still. It wasn't aged at all. It was still called whiskey. We wouldn't call it whiskey today, but it was basically the, the, the naked spirit. So it was straight runoff, straight off the still, bottled, and then people could do what they wanted with it when they had it. So it was unaged spirit, okay? First World War breaks out, uh, 1914, and Lloyd George is teetotal. He's Prime Minister at the time. He's teetotal and is very much a prohibitionist. Now, this in, uh, t uh, temperance movement and stuff had really started to take hold worldwide, okay? Um, Lloyd George in 1915 brings in an act called the Aged Spirits Act, 
which we still use today as a reference point in some ways, uh, where whiskey has to be aged a minimum of three years in a cask. Now, prior to that, it could be sold straight off the still. Now it has to be aged for three years. You can understand where that's an economic hammer blow to the distilleries. You now have lots and lots of stock that you cannot sell. Okay, so you have barrel of th thousands of barrels that are have to you can't sell for three years. So that was a blow. The Royal Commission for Irish the Royal Commission saying that uh, green whiskey was whiskey was a, a first blow. Then came the Age Spirit Act. Then in the nineteen twenties you had. Uh, the Volstead Act in America, so you had Prohibition, which was, in many ways, Irish whiskey at that point was still seen as the quality product. So when something's a quality product, what happens? That's what the bootleggers were copying. They were selling off basically gut rot whiskey uh, as Irish whiskey. So, so that quickly... That that harms the brand, but Marty, surely. That, that annihilates the brand because people don't know if they're going to get um, bush mills or something that's brewed in a, a, a you know a, a milk churn on a farm somewhere. Right. So the other thing was, well, there's a, a couple of different things for the Scotch industry. If you buy a bottle of Laphroaig, now Laphroaig is really, really heavily peated and 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 medicinal okay and medicinal is a key word here too if you buy a bottle of Laphroaig and put two teaspoonfuls of Laphroaig into this this will start to taste like Laphroaig okay so what they were able to do the bootleggers well they bought basically watered down industrial alcohol but one barrel of Laphroaig goes a very very long way so suddenly these people are starting to get a taste for that Scottish whiskey taste okay so you can see where that starts to come in and they go actually that's not bad but I, I quite like that the other thing was alcohol wasn't totally banned in the US during the, the, the prohibition era you could get a prescription from the doctor to allow you to buy whiskey because it was seen as a medicine <laughs> now I, don't, I wish the NHS had this but what you could do is you could go and get a prescription and, and go and get a bottle of whiskey. So Irish whiskey wasn't necessarily seen as being that beneficial medicinally when you had these other sort of heavy chemical tastes to them. So that sort of smoky peated thing started to come through then as well. So people during Prohibition actually could get their hands on some alcohol. Famously, Winston Churchill was saying, got a a four dollar prescription as it was known when he was there so <laughs> yeah he wasn't going to go without so as i say you had this that happened then uh, when prohibition came back when the whiskey sort of industry started to come back again and uh, in some ways during the, the 1920s you have to remember ireland had completely changed you had partition and that caused all manner of ructions. One uh, devil era decided to go on a trade war with the United, with the UK and, and at the time the Empire, which was a third of the globe. So, you know, you, you cut off all these international markets. Uh, the devil era really wanted to focus on the domestic market. So when it came to the Second World War, um, Churchill said that the barley growing for, for malt had to keep going because it was seen as being a massive money maker for, uh, for, for the UK, for the war effort. So they were exporting uh, whiskey all the way across to, to the US and it was a great money maker. De Valera, on the other hand, thought he could make more money on the domestic market. So what he did was he cut exports. So just at the time when they probably could have had a bit more of an impact by selling in the US, he cut the market to it. So they were again they were developing a taste for, for Scotch whiskey. So there was a there's a whole 
it just was a perfect storm. And all of these big whiskey distilleries, pretty much all of them disappeared. Okay, so the ones that offered Barnard went and seen. Now you skip along until the 1970s. Uh, you skip along to the 1970s and Irish whiskey is in absolute crisis. It's in total disarray. There's, it's the seals are plummeted. People are now drinking um, Smirnoff and, and this kind of stuff. You know, they're drinking all that uh, white spirits, as it's known. Now, the distilleries that were in Dublin, yeah, and I'm talking about Bow Street and stuff, they get together and say, right, we can't survive as independent businesses. We need to form. Irish distillers. Now, there's a lot. There's an awful lot more complexity to all of this. What they do is they decide to amalgamate and move to Middleton, down in Cork or down near Cork. So they spend a huge amount of money. Um, off the top of my head, someone tells me it was nine million pound at the time. Uh, building a brand new distillery. Middleton had a distillery, small affair. This was huge, but all of these brands amalgamate it. So you had uh, uh, Pars and and uh, <laughs> see off the top of my head, I just bad. So you had Pars and Jameson and, and the likes of Redbreast and stuff. All of this all under one umbrella in made in Middleton. Up here you you had Bush Mills and Coal Rain. Coal Rain stopped producing. Um, they became a bottling plant that was bought over by Bush Mills. All of the other distilleries kind of disappeared. To give you an idea of some of the scale of, of the whiskey stocks that these guys had, when the the distilleries closed down in Derry, the, the Watts distilleries down in Derry, they closed down in the 1920s, I think it was 1925. They had enough stock that they were still selling whiskey for blending right up until the 1960s. So 40 years worth of stock because people just weren't drinking it. And they were able to sell it to blenders. So wow. it gave you a scale of just how big and how big a fall from grace this was. Um, uh, 1915, just a quick aside, 1915, uh, the, 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 the Bogside Distillery, the Watts Bogside Distillery, had a, a whiskey fire. Pretty much all the distilleries got fire at one point. Um, they started breaking the casks. And the whiskey started flowing down the street. So, so the loads and loads of people went out and just started filling buckets and buckets and buckets of the stuff and taking it home with them. So sounds, I imagine, sounds, sounds about right. Sounds about right. I, I imagine there were probably people still drinking that up until the 1960s. There was that much of it. But so it's just this total devastation of the whole um, industry. Tullamore Jew, for example, um, down in Tullamore, obviously. Um, they stopped producing, um, but they started making Irish mist, that sort of Irish whiskey liqueur. Now, what happened was they stopped distilling, but they still had enough stock to keep going for a, a, approximately 10 years. But as the whiskey started to run out, they made a deal with um, powers to, for them to supply the whiskey. Basically, they were taken over. Uh, Powers got the brand, um, but the, the dailies, they, they went on to the board uh, and things. So the distillery just was left to rot, okay? It never reopened. They didn't have to reopen it because they didn't they didn't need to produce the whiskey for it. And so it kind of disappeared. The brand didn't really disappear, but the distillery did. Now, 1980s. In oh, hold, hold on before we skip for we'll jump forward. You take a drink and I'll give some other people a mention here. Uh, Julie Mason's tuned in tonight. Evening, Julie. Uh, really enjoying the history, Marty. Such a great amount of knowledge and information. Yes, it, it really is superb. I'm living and learning all the time here. Andreas Schuch is saying hello. Good abend, Andreas. Uh, ah. Good abend. Uh, uh, and Sean O'Neill is saying. Uh, spots were put on the barrels because lots of the workers couldn't read or write, hence putting different colours in the barrels instead of writing in them. One of the living relatives of the founders of Mitch's son said this a few weeks ago in the interview. I must watch yeah. that. Where's that interview? Did you see that interview, Marty? No, that, that sounds interesting, that one. See, that, that interview, there's a lot. Um, I imagine it's probably there'll be a link to it on the Irish Whiskey Facebook page, I would think. Uh, I haven't probably seen it, would. But. 
Pr probably mm -hmm. probably would be. But what happens if you're colorblind? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know. What happens if you're colorblind? Uh, and uh, Mark Kerr's joined the show. Uh, strangely, just poured <laughs> a glass of Tullamore Dew. So Good. drink whiskey, drink whiskey, drink whiskey. There yes. you go. So we're, we're jumping forward to... A more contemporary period now, Marty, because we're 36 minutes in. Time is right. flying tonight. Right, right. right. I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly. In comes uh, a, 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 a fantastic man called John Teeling, or Dr. John Teeling, as he is known. He buys the Cooley Distillery. Now, the Cooley Distillery was a potato industrial alcohol plant. And he decided that Irish whiskey had a future, and he actually bought... The stills from the old Cumber Distillery. Okay, what right. happened was it was shut down in the nineteen fifties. The Ben Nevis Distillery in Scotland, over in Fort William, had bought the stills and transplanted them over there. He then figured, found out that this is where they were, so he bought them and then brought them back to County Louth. Okay, so he started to 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 produce whiskey. Now he was the first guy to really twig. We can get some traction uh, and sort of fake heritage, if you like, by buying old-time whiskey brands, the likes of Clear Connell. Now, if you can just see that, mm -hmm. okay, on this bottle, it says 1762. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the Andrew A. Watt Distillery, uh, the, the Andrew Watt Distillery, they had two of them in Derry. So this says at the bottom of it, County Louth. It's not really true. Um, but this harks back to a whiskey that was quite famous at a time uh, in the US. You could still get old advertising hoardings and stuff from from the likes of Yankee Stadium and stuff yeah. with this. So he he's, he's an extremely clever man. I've met him a few times. He's an absolute gentleman, a lovely guy. And so he bought this. So he had literally just taken over a distillery. He had an extremely hard time. Uh, at one point, he had a weekend to try and, one weekend to try and find five and a half million pounds. Now, I've had 45 years and I can't find five and a half million pounds, but <laughs> <laughs> being, being as persuasive as he is, he, he didn't get five and a half. He got enough to sort of keep the, the, the wolves from the door and he managed to save it. He also then bought the old Locke Distillery, I took over the, the Kilbegan brand mm -hmm. and it brought this kind of thing back. So he bought into this sort of fake heritage. And some of them are now, some of them are called Cooley clones. As in, I mean, this is one here uh, in a show. One. Okay. Um, it's distilled, bottled, and uh, matured, bottled in Ireland by Andrew A. Watt and called Cooley County Louth. Andrew Watt. Yeah, like, <laughs> no, what, what, what one's up here and the other's down there, isn't it? Something like that. Uh, the, the other side of Ulster. Yes. Now this, I haven't opened this because this is this is actually now a wee bit of a collectible. It was dead, dead cheap, and now they discontinued it. It's actually really nice. Uh, I may open it at some point. I have already opened a few bottles of it, but I'll keep in that one. So, what has happened since? At the start of this, you uh, showed the. Um, the map or oh, the current, well, it's not actually current because there's a little bit more to add to it. Yeah. On this now, you have 49 distilleries. Uh, what you're what you're seeing is some names starting to reappear. Uh, we're long dead. And I'm thinking along the lines of the Rowan Co. Uh, George Rowe, huge distillery it was down, um, down, near, down near Guinness. Uh, Row and Guinness used to have a, a bit of a rivalry. Um, if you go to St. Patrick's Cathedral, you'll see Benjamin Guinness, the statue of him outside it. He paid for the renovation for St. Patrick's. The Roe family paid for the renovations of Christchurch Cathedral. So it was this sort of rivalry between the two. Diageo, who own the, the Roe & Co. brand, have now spent millions on a new uh, distillery and visitor centre. So they have bought that. You have um, the likes of Obviously, the Dunville's brands. Now, Dunville's, I, I, I talked about them a few times. Uh, Dunville's have um, really invested a lot of time and effort in this. 
they they take it really seriously. Uh, by that I mean they have uh, they sponsor uh, Distillery Football Club and and they they, they sent a lady across to um, find all the find all the old adverts and stuff uh, in in newspapers in the US and stuff. So they they they've really bought into the whole thing and really really good. Some of the brands that have continued through, uh, and I'm thinking about the likes of Crested 10, it's now, now branded as Crested. Uh, this is actually an old bottle from the 70s, um, which was distilled in Bow Street. Okay. Bow Street, Bow Street, Bow Street has um, reopened as a visitor centre. They, 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 they tell you that there's whiskey there, but it's kept in the... In the, in, in the cellars as such they don't really have a distillery there they just have a um a, a warehouse essentially but it's they, they get to say that they have their aging whiskey in our in dublin so the first aged whiskey in dublin for for mm-hmm. a while kilbegan similarly they, this is actually made in kilbegan for a long time they, they distilled a tiny little amount it was all brought down from cooley they really just wanted to have the brand um that so these sort of lasted again. Bush Mills, obviously. Uh, this is an interesting one. Korean. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, it says on the back of it, "Product of Middleton Distillery, County Cork." Right. So, okay. Yeah. This would have been nothing, nothing like uh, the original Korean whiskey. Korean whiskey was pot still. It was. F- Supposedly the best in Ireland. It was the the, the whiskey of the House of Commons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This you'll see that this isn't open. Okay, there's a reason for that. I've tasted it before. So moving quickly on. Um, now you've started to see some of the, as I say, JJ Corey coming back. Um, I sent you a picture because I don't actually have a bottle of it yet of the McConnells. Yep, we we have it there. Yep, yep, yep. A Belfast brand doing what the Belfast brand did. They buy in the whiskey. They 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 they, they make it up and sell it the, the type that they want. Again, harking back to the heritage, the, the label, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you you know you've got all these. I mean, the likes of Jameson last at the course uh, kept on uh, this very wonderful little product again with the wee Burt Reynolds uh, medallion on it. Matt Darcy. Again, this is another one that they're investing a lot of time and effort doing the research to to, to buy into the story, to get the heritage, to get the the ethos of the company and so on and so forth. So this is this is really uh, a key part of their, their marketing and branding and history and so on and so forth. Um and it's, it's to their credit, you know. Um the likes of the likes of the Inner Showing one where it's as you said earlier on, is are, are there some of them just slapping a label on top of it? I have to say, a lot of the Cooley stuff kind of has that feel to it. The the other stuff, the, the, I mean, the, the Matt Darcy and the and the the, the the Dumbles one, there's much more of a you know we're buying into this this heritage. Uh, uh, Sh- Sh- Sean O'Neill says a, a very witty thing there. He says stories and sips. I mean, it, 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 that's almost what it is. It's a, it, uh, you know, never let the truth get in the good way of, away of a good story. You know what I mean? Oh, no, stories and sips. Stories and sips is a podcast. So that, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a podcast, um, but obviously you, go, you get it on the, on, the, on the usual podcast thing. So that's where the interview must have been for that's the... That, that's what you're talking about, the interview earlier on that went into... Uh, what, what, what was he talking about? We get that many messages a night. It's very hard to stay on top of it without a producer telling me in my ear. All <laughs> I'm doing is listening to the show in my ear, by the way. So uh, I don't there's, have... Uh, there's no team behind us, by the way. There's not, there's not very much prep work done on this either. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting seven dates right now, nothing to hate about. But uh, <laughs> no, I I be honest with you. You see the Rowan Co one. I'm, this this annoyed me a little bit because this is Diageo um, who bought. And if you go down now to the, the, the visitor center, and invest a huge amount of money. But it kind of feels a little bit like they have slapped it on. Um, the bottle doesn't look anything like what the bottle would have looked like. There's there's not that much invested in the heritage. And to me, 
if you're a company the size of Diageo and doing that, it's a little bit lazy, if I'm honest. Um, they would have the, obviously the money, the resources and experience to come up with new stuff and, and to really push it and pump it and do new and interesting stuff. To me, it, it doesn't sit particularly well with me, but who am I to argue with the mighty Guinness for Diageo, you know? Well, a, a lot of people are saying very complimentary things uh, about uh, the man in uh, County Louth in Irish whiskey, smart and determined. Uh, that's what it takes. Cooley did some fantastic whiskies. There you go. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, Irish whiskey, if I'm totally honest. Um, I think lots of people are riding on the, the coattails of, of Dr. John. Um, I, 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 th I take my hat off to him. As I say, I think he, he made a lot of the key decision to to get Irish whiskey back onto its feet. Um, <laughs> and, and I think I think Barry 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 does the the podcast. He he? He, he's saying my stories and sips ears are burning. Well, listen. There's nothing worse than uh, being talked about, and that's uh, not being talked about at all. There you go. So, uh, uh, let me see what else are people saying tonight. Uh, uh, Frank Hearn has sent, just found out why I love tailings. It's the Cumber Stills. Frank Hearn, I think, is in County Down, but he lives in Scotland. Is, is he? I'm just uh, no. the screen. Yes, that's what they're saying. Yes. Uh, the, the Cumber Stills went into the Cooley Distillery. Um, the tailings, tailings bought up. Part of the deal when they sold um, the Cooley Distillery was they kept a fair amount of the stock. So the, the, that... The, the, some of the earlier tealing stuff, the newer stuff, Frank, um, uh, it's made in Dublin, my friend, um, and, and quite good at it too, very good at it. Uh, and we're also getting uh, messages in. Uh, Michael Matthews saying, is looking forward to Belfast Whiskey Week. Waterford launched two new offerings today at one o'clock. Uh, you couldn't buy a bottle by two o'clock. Whiskey is big business with a lot of new followers. Yes, uh, we have a lot of followers. Yes, uh, not just whiskey. We have a lot of followers as well. If you'd like to be one of our followers, make sure you go on our uh, ulsterwhiskey.com uh, page. Uh, you can also go to the uh uh, newsletter and sign up for it as well. Uh, so it's worth doing as well. If you want to sign up for the newsletter, it is very, very good indeed. This is how you get to the newsletter. You click this link, you'll see it in the feed appearing very, very shortly but beneath the comments. And that is how you sign up. Uh, so quite a few people signed up for that already. It does look like Gibbert gobbledygook, but if you copy and paste it into the search bar at the top of the screen, it'll take you through there. Just do the GGPR, click yes, and then uh, send your name. And it's as simple as that. Send your email address, uh, and, and that's it. Now, we've got about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left tonight. Where do we have to go now, Marty? Wait, well, I want to just say about the, the, the map that was on there. If you go back to our good friend, Alfred Bernard, um, some of the old distilleries are now starting to appear. Uh, some of them don't appear on that map, actually, but they are now registered as distilleries. Um, you're, you're going to start seeing probably a bit more of these harking back. And what you can do is, if you get this book and look through the stuff and see and see what the heritage, you can check to see what the how authentic they're being as such, you know. Um, I would recommend that book, even if you're not necessarily a whiskey fan, even just as a, as a sort of travel guide and looking around, it does make for superb reading. Um, it's a it's a wonderful document, but wonderful to to. I can see you walking around with that book, Marty, and being like what Michael Portillo is to trains. You could be to whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. They have to wear one of those salmon pink coats, no? I thought you already had one of them for tour guiding. Do you not? No. I keep I keep that for private occasions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so listen, we've got ten minutes left. If you want to get in touch with the show, just uh, comment, like, and share. Hit send. It'll appear, especially if you're watching on the main feed at Irish Whiskey Review on Facebook or ulsterwhiskey.com. You can click through and find us that way as well on Tinternet. Now. Uh, a lot of these new ones are appearing. We still have to do them, don't we, in the final 10 minutes? Yeah. 
what I'm saying, what I'm saying is about these new distilleries that are sort of harking back, and I'm talking in some cases about the likes of the Tullamore Dew. This is now owned by Grants, the the, the big Scottish uh, whiskey distillery or whiskey brand, and they have pumped uh, thirty million euro into the new experience centre down there. Uh, it's beautiful. It's really, really good. There's there's some nice little touches to it. Um, down by the river, there's new jobs on it. You know, you know, and all of this matters. You know, this it's all it's all right. Um, talking about the history of stuff, but if you want to talk about the future, there has to be money invested in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people are investing a lot in it. Um, this crested ten has been rebranded as crested. Uh, this bottle, actually, what I'm drinking here now is, is 50 years old. Okay, um, uh, if I'm totally honest, it's, it's probably as better today than it is in this. Um, but you have all these new brands, new exciting brands, new developments, but they are kind of harking back to the past. Um, in some ways, it's very good. Some ways, it's probably not fantastic. Uh, in some ways, um, but. Uh, you do have a history and a heritage, and uh, pretty much every area of Ireland has that history and heritage, and and, and it's played such a huge part in the history and the shaping and everything of this this wonderful place that I live in. Um, that it is worth checking out. Um, and whiskey is a, a very fun way of doing it. You know, it's better. It's better than whiskey. We've got some really <laughs> great comments coming in here tonight. Here, Peter McCabe says. Excellent chat, Marty, and I don't even like whiskey. I think he just hasn't found the whiskey for him yet. This is it. This is it. I, I, I guarantee you, Peter, I could get you a whiskey that you would like. And if you don't like it, I will. So uh, <laughs> we, can all, we can find a compromise. Now, we've got some questions tonight, Marty. Uh, what, yeah. Did we have one earlier we had to go back to? Did we answer that one, did we? I think we did. Uh, we, we're being asked, what do you think of slaying? Um, I... I uh, <laughs> Uh, I like it. Um, I liked it more the first time I ever tasted it was at the Belfast Whiskey Social. Um, I thought it was super, but that was about four whiskeys, five whiskeys in. Um, it's all right. Yeah, it's okay. But again, it's the, it's the entry level. Um, it's their, their, the, the one that they have out is basically their entry level. You can't necessarily judge a brand by what they first bring out. It's it's a bit. Once the distilleries get in the mature stock and stuff, like the Waterford Distillery has released their stuff this week, um, you'll, you'll have an indication of what they're going to be like. Did you manage but, to get a bottle of that, Marty of Waterford? No, no, I didn't. But I'm in, I mean, I, I, I may be able to get a bottle. Shall okay. we say? I've got one. Okay, uh, Frank Hearn's also staying. He staying just cracked open. <laughs> 50-year-old, what one was that we were talking about earlier? A 50-year-old, was it, was it that? But this isn't a 50. This bottle was done in the Bow Street Distillery in Dublin. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not it's not a 50-year-old whiskey, as uh, by what you would buy an age statement. Mm-hmm. Age is how long it's in the barrel. But this whiskey, is, the actual liquid in this was distilled at the very latest in, in the 1970s. So it's... Probably the liquid in it is 50 years old. And, and, and I must admit, people that know each other but only come across each other, uh, Michael Mash is just saying, uh, watch out, Dave Cummings is in the house because they can see who else is watching. <laughs> Another legend of whiskey when he's not breeding cattle. Uh, and, and, and then, Marty, <laughs> the response comes back, uh, Michael, all right, lad, just up from the farm, all the cattle are good. There you go. <laughs> Dave all the way down and and all the way down in Dingle, uh, and yes, they uh, they're one of the new brands who set up their own brand, decided to go with their own branding, their own tradition, start from scratch as such. And round of applause to them. They do wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff, beautiful place. Get down, go and visit them. It's fantastic. I used My to have to, I used to have to rescue cars uh, from the big long beach down there, and uh, well. I used to have friendly farmers down there that used to drag Mercedes Benz that had driven on the beach out of the out of the tide just before <laughs> all the got got 
got washed. Now, uh, Connor Farrell is saying uh, Slain is still a sore spirit. They still yeah. have to age their own product. Exactly. And that's what that's what I mean. That it's a source spirit. There's lots of these new brands, as I say, are buying in age stock, and it's coming from a very shallow pool. You know, there's not, there just isn't massively aged stock. Um, so again, it's 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 a it's a nice, approachable, easy enough whiskey. But you do don't necessarily judge what they're going to be doing, but what they've done already. So they they could be in a few years' time bringing out the the best whiskey in the world but they haven't it's not ready yet so that's and dave's coming is coming back with he says would have loved it if jameson had put a microbrewery distillery in bow street uh would have been something to behold uh yes mm -hmm. it, it it probably probably would have would have been uh there, there's the old bow street there uh in, in dublin uh, I, I think they would get cross Dublin Corporation if you if you tried to put a, a distillery of any sort where they didn't want to put Marty. Uh, planning permission quite tough for these micro distilleries. Uh, probably not as much as you would think. Um, they, 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 I mean, they're not very polluting. They don't have to be very big. I mean, the Dingle Distillery is basically a, a, a large cattle shed. It's not a big. My, you know, it's not. I'm not, not saying I don't want to sound derogatory about the whole thing, but it's it's a fairly small operation. I'm well, surprised how small it is. You know? Most industrial units are just uh, the same building technique as a cattle shed. You know, with the, with uh, offices in it and a bit more services. Uh, Michael Matthews is is agreeing. He's saying, uh, "What a great idea." Uh, I I think these microbreweries, micro distilleries are are a wonderful idea. And uh, I'm getting cramped in my leg, by the way, just in case why you wonder why I'm moving. Uh, uh, never sit still for 45 minutes, that's the rule. Uh, and uh, Dave Cummings is saying, I uh, think they missed a trick when they renovated there a few years back. Imagine Crested being back in Bow Street. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think Dave has a very good point. Uh, Irish distillers, who, you know, essentially Jameson and so on, uh, put the micro distillery in Middleton. And did all their new experimental stuff, you know, the method and madness is a new a new brand from Irish Distillers. Um and I don't really I don't necessarily see why they couldn't have put it in Bow Street. It would probably have been a very, very good idea, but commercial reasons, I suppose, or logistics, who knows? So uh we'll we'll wrap it up, Marty. What do you think the future holds then? Uh, the future's bright. Um that map. Uh, is missing a new announcement of another distillery coming. Apparently, they're bringing a distillery to Glenarm. It was announced last week they're going to build a distillery, but nobody seems to know who it is and nobody seems to know more about it. So there will be a lot, an awful lot more. But there is room. Uh, I, I discovered the other day that uh, the US now has over 1,600 distilleries. Well, that's 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 a lot, a lot. Uh, cool Rain uh, is a name from the past, says Frank Hearn. Is there a future to develop the name? Absolutely. Uh, personally, I mean, I mean, this this is is not good. Let's be honest. This is very poor. It's sixteen pounds a bottle, and as I said last week, ten pounds eighty of this is tax. So it kind of gives you an idea of the quality of stuff in it, but. The old Colerain, the pot still of Colerain, you can still pick up the odd bottle of it at auction and it goes for a huge amount of money. Um, it was really ranked as one of the premium brands, but it just disappeared. So there's lots of scope for Colerain to, to hark back to their past. Again, this is another one of those, we'll just make it stick an old label on it and hopefully people will still remember it. Um, kind of cheap and cheerful. Doesn't do any service really. It does a huge disservice actually to the the heritage of the old Corey and the story, which, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, Michael Matthews saying uh, thanks. Uh, enjoyed the. the uh, this is his first time here, Michael. I could have sworn I'd seen somebody in a cycle hat uh, before on 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 the lineup. Trevor Watson is saying cheers uh, and thanks. Uh, Connor Farrell saying, great show tonight, lads. Uh, what is it? Dave Cummings is saying, whoa, whoa more whiskey. Yes, <laughs> very good. And yeah. uh, 
this keep, might be one last. Keep, 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 keep the beef coming. All right. Uh, th well, listen, everybody, uh, thanks for the platitudes. There you go. Uh, Sean O'Neill, thanks, guys. Another great listen. And James Moira Doherty. Uh, the capacity of most of the new distilleries is pretty small in whiskey terms, so there should be room for more, uh, for most hesitate to say all. Yes, there yeah. should.